Hi guys, in this video I'm going to talk about a very cool improvement to the ABC algorithms called regression adjustment. And this is uh, based on papers by Beaumont and Bloom and Francois. I hope I pronounced the name right. So remember that in ABC, and it doesn't matter if we are using rejection, MCMC, or sequential Monte Carlo, uh, we input some theta to a simulator and it outputs an X for us. And then we try to find the theta that give us similar results to the actual observed X. Okay, it could be the theta that give us exactly that X, but in more realistic scenarios, theta that gave us Xs that are close enough to the X observed. But immediately, this also implies in some way that there is a structure between X and theta. So for each given X, there is some distribution over theta of plausible values that if you plug them into the simulator, that, you, that will give you that X. So if we would draw it here X and here theta, so for some particular X, there could be some distribution over theta. So it could be that these thetas will often give that X, but these theta will give them more rarely but over here, there can be nothing, yeah? Like no theta, okay? No theta with this value will ever produce um, this X, okay? So there is already some structure that we can start seeing between X and theta. And in fact, that shouldn't come as much surprise to us because if we look at the entire process, what we are basically doing, we're inputting some X and we are getting from the process a distribution over theta. We are getting the posterior distribution over theta. In fact, this is how we write it. We write it as the posterior distribution given some x. So it's a function of some x. Okay, It's a function of theta, obviously. The, the distribution is a function of theta, but it also depends on x. So if we change the x, we get different functions. We get different distributions. And for example, it could be that for, and now this is theta, for x equals zero, we might get a distribution that looks like this, yeah? And for x equal one, we might get a distribution that looks like this. And for x equal two, we might get a distribution that looks like this, etc. Okay, so this whole notion that there is a structure between x and theta shouldn't really surprise us. And what we can do now is start hypothesize about the nature of this structure. So the most simple structure is a linear one, meaning we can assume that if you move the X, it changes the mean of the posterior. So it changes the mean of the posterior distribution. And how does it change it? It changes it in a linear fashion. And for simplicity, we can also assume that the variance stays the same. So when I move X, it only changes the mean. It, it doesn't change the variance. And this is called almost catasticity. And this is exactly what a linear regression model does. OK, so for a one dimensional case, we would write it like this. And maybe with an alpha in front or some beta 0. And for a one dimensional, we would write it like this. And here we can assume that maybe the first element of X is 1, and it corresponds to some beta 0 in the beta vector which gives us the intercept or the offset. And if we are using a summary statistic, we can write it like this. And again, the variance stays constant. And we have some noise, some, we have some randomness, some stochasticity. And we assume that it's mean with zero and that the variance stays constant. We don't assume it's necessarily normal, uh, but we, we do assume that it's with a mean zero and a constant variance. And now another thing we can do is we can adjust the whole process to some reference point. Yeah, we can uh, take off X observed and make our data centered around X observed. Yeah, so our new data won't be just every X, it will be X minus that X observed, minus that baseline reference. Um, and you can, you can do this, you just change your data. Yeah, you just, from all the data you subtract X observed, it doesn't matter. When x i minus x observed is zero, it means that we are looking now at the structure at the point where x is equal to x observed. And we can now do ordinary least square and solve it. We have a design matrix, a column of one for the alphas and uh, p columns for the betas. 
then we solve it. Well, how do we solve it? We just uh, minimize the sum of the square differences and we get this. And notice that now here, even though theta was actually uh, sample first and then generated the x, we are treating it exactly the opposite. We are treating the theta as the y's uh, in this case. So this is the thing we want uh, to predict. This is the, this is the variate and x's are the covariates. OK, so we can solve this and then find our alphas and betas. And if we believe our structure is good, meaning that it really captured the true structure of the process, we can now adjust all the points we accepted to be exactly equal to x observed. OK, so maybe it had some distance from x observed, but now we can use this model to adjust it that's such that it's exactly on x observed. So what we do is we take all the thetas and then we use the model to adjust them. And this is why it's called a regression adjustment. Okay, and I will show you more in the graph so it becomes more clear. Another way to think about it is that if we know alpha, then we know the mean of the posterior because alpha is the mean of the posterior in, in this new representation. And now if we could only draw from these, from these Xs, then uh, we could have a sample from the posterior, but we don't have these Cs. So let's use instead the empirical residuals. So let's take these, which are exactly, let's take these, which are exactly the empirical residuals and use them as the, these noise random uh, terms. And, and then this will be our sample from the posterior. And this is exactly uh, a development from this equation. We just um, leave alpha and C, in the same point and we move uh, this to the other side and we therefore get the sample from the posterior. Okay, so let's see it in a graph. So here I have, so on the x-axis, I have the new representation, right? Uh, of some summary statistics, but for simplicity, you can also ignore the summary statistics, yeah? It's just the x's and I center it around x observed. And in the y-axis, I have the thetas. OK, and let's suppose that this is our uh, structure and you can see here the linear, the linear fit, the regression fit that we do in this uh, uh, structure. And you can also see that we, we stop it at three. So here we, I assume that the threshold is three. OK, so let's suppose we accept everything that is up to a uh, distance of three and we uh, keep it. And now what do we do actually with all the points? So what we do is we take this point, for example, this point over here, and we subtract from it this distance over here. Okay, so the distance to the line from the alpha. Yeah, this is the alpha that we have. And notice it's not exactly zero. Okay, so we subtract this, and then we move it, and it will be somewhere here. We will do everything. So we move all these points downwards and all this point upwards. And after adjustment, uh, we would get this thing over here, okay? And we can see that now the distribution, if we look at the distribution over theta, it looks much narrower, right? So here, the distribution over theta, it was between more or less four and minus four. And now the distribution over theta is between one and minus one, more or less, okay? And if we plot this with an inverse graph, yeah, so if we plot theta, on the x-axis and sx minus s observed and s observed here is zero, then we get something like this. And this is a graph, I'm actually not sure where I took it, maybe from uh, CSUN presentation, but I'm not sure. And so you can see here that this thing over here is without adjustment. If we just do rejection ABC, this is with a threshold of one. So the threshold is one. Okay, so we take all these points, and then if we see how the posterior looks like, you see it's really spread between one and minus one. But if we do regression adjustment, we move all these points here and all these points here, okay, and we would get uh, the points are all over here. This narrows down the distribution, and we get something that is closer to the true posterior, to the true density. And what does this allows us to do? It allows us to improve the accuracy, yeah? So the problem with these points is that they did not exactly produce the same X observed that we, we've seen. So we adjust them according to the model 
and we improve the accuracy. Okay, and a first generalization that you can do is maybe improve the model, right? So here we use the regular uh, linear regression, a really simple linear regression. In the paper, they talk about local linear regression, but I think they are mistaken because um, this is not a local linear as there is no window that you're moving. Okay, what they are actually doing is just weighted linear regression. So the idea here is that instead of treating every observation the same, let's weight it by how much it's close to the X simulated. Okay, so we can use some uh, weighting kernel, either a Panechnikov or a Gaussian kernel, and it will give more weight as if X simulated is very close to X observed and less and less weight uh, if X simulated is further away from X observed. And if we solve this, well, it just becomes that a weighted least squares, we have a weight matrix W, it's a diagonal matrix with the kernel values in the diagonal. And now we might want to test how good this improvement is. So let's suppose on the X axis, yeah, I'm plotting the threshold values, but instead of plotting uh, the threshold as an actual absolute number, let's, let's use the percentage of accepted samples. So we can start from 0%, we don't accept anything, and we can move to 100%, we accept all the points. But in the first paper, they only checked at around 15 or 20%, yeah? So they only checked up to 15%. And with rejection ABC, you usually get between 5%, more or less. And on the y-axis, yeah, we plot the error. Okay, so we are measuring, um, for example, how close is the posterior mean to the actual data that generate the data. And we know the data because we, we decided on it. It's a simulation. And what we will see is that, for example, the true error, yeah, for example, if we use MCMC, looks something like this. And for rejection ABC, the error goes something like this. Okay, so the more and more you increase the threshold, you get worse and worse uh, result. The accuracy goes down, but with regression adjustment, it looks something like this, okay? So it goes up again in the beginning, but then it kind of plateaus, at least until the 15%. Later in the next paper, they tested it on some other problems, and then it shows that actually it also kind of goes up more, but at least at some point here, it allows you to increase the threshold and get even better results than without using regression adjustment. So the bottom line is that we accept more point. And if we accept more point, it means that we are also less prone to the curse of dimensionality. So the big pro of this method, this regression adjustment, is that we can increase the threshold and we improve our uh, ability to handle uh, larger and larger dimensions. The problem or the con of this method is that if you get the model wrong, if you get the regression wrong, you actually get worse approximation. So looking back at the example of Sisson that I showed in a previous video, this is uh, with a regular rejection. And you can see that uh, with one dimension, we're already not going to the exact posterior or the exact distribution. We lose a bit, but it's still good enough. Uh, two, it's already a really big deterioration and three and four, it's already, it loses the bimodal uh, property. With regression adjustment, you can see that even with two and four, uh, we are still pretty good. With six, we, with six and eight, we still have the bimodal. So it really allows you to increase the dimensionality of the problem without uh, hurting too badly on the accuracy. Okay, so this was the first paper that actually um, started this idea, but then there was another generalization or improvement given in another paper by Bloom and Francois. So what they did is, th is that they decided that instead of just learning a linear structure that uh, relates the mean and the uh, axes, let's assume uh, a nonlinear structure. And also, instead of assuming uh, the same variance, Let's assume that also the variance can vary. And how will you learn the structure? Well, uh, instead of linear regression, let's use neural networks, feed forward neural networks to be precise. So how would it look? So before 
with the uh, regular regression adjustment, we had the x's and we had the thetas. And let's say this is the, the structure and you would have the same variance no matter where the x was. And now the new improvement is saying, well, we no longer need that the line will be straight. It can actually be anything. It can be going like this and like this. Okay, so no longer straight. And also it doesn't have to be that the variance stays the same. So it could be that here there's little variance, but here there's a lot of variance. And here again, a little variance and here even bigger variance. Okay, so the variance can also change. And you, how do you train the neural network to discover the structure? Well, you train one neural network to optimize the mean, but now the function is not linear anymore. It's just a neural network. And so it's a really simple loss function, but actually they also use the weighted regression. So they also added this kernel for the weights and they also added an L2 regularization. And this is to help prevent overfitting when you train the neural network. And once you have the means, you can now also model the variance. And it's better to model the log variance. So the problem is unconstrained. And you take the log of the squared error and you assume it's some function of x plus some error term. Yeah, for example, you can, if it was a linear structure, you could maybe assume that it looks something like this. And what it means, it means that the log variance increase. So the variance also increases as a function of axis. Yeah. So for example, in the original data, it might look like uh, this. And at, and at first you might have a little variance, but then it increases and then it's even increases more and then it even increases more. Yeah. So here it's, so here it's X and the variance and here it's X and theta and this is the variance. Okay, and so this is the loss function. You optimize this. And again, if you trust that you have a good model, you can adjust all the points to have the same uh, mean and variance. So you first demean the points, then you adjust their variance, and then you add the mean of the observed, of, the, of your baseline, basically. Okay, so this was a major improvement instead of using instead of constraining yourself to just a linear model and homoscedastic variants, you, you allow for a more flexible structure and you also allow for flexible changing variants. And another thing they did is they said, well, let's do it two times. Let's do an adaptive algorithm. Let's run it first and get a sample of the posterior after we also do this advanced improved regression adjustment. And then once we have this sample of the posterior, this first sample of the posterior, let's use it to constrain the prior. So let's look at the sample and look what is the domain of this sample? What is the minimum and maximum point of this sample? And then let's draw again from the prior and then only keep the points that are uh, within this uh, interval of uh, theta min and theta max, and then use these thetas to uh, do rejection ABC, for example, and use uh, regression adjustment, and then use the second sample as the true posterior. Now, technically, uh, since we change the prior, what we get is not a posterior based on the prior, but a posterior based on this adjusted prior. But actually, we don't have to worry because um, it turns out that the math comes up right. If we wanted that the sample would be from the real prior, we would have to weight them according to these importance weights. But actually, uh, it turns out that these important weights, they don't depend on the actual value of theta. So the posterior PDF will just have a, a normalizing constant, but this doesn't affect the actual sample. But this is just a technical note. Anyway, how does this new version, this new uh, regression adjustment using also neural networks, how well does it perform? Well, if we look again at yeah, the acceptance rate between zero and let's say 100% and the error, 
then again, this might be the best error that you get with MCMC. And of course, uh, in their test problems, they were easy enough where they could actually perform MCMC. But in SBI, you can't do MCMC. You have to do something like uh, ABC version of MCMC. But for the uh, comparing sake, they took problems where they could actually uh, calculate the likelihood, but they just chose to ignore it and pretend that it's intractable. Okay, so again, we have like regular rejection ABC looks something like this. Regression adjustment, the regular regression adjustment looks something like this maybe, up to maybe 20%, it's okay. Yeah, so this is rejection ABC. This is regression adjustment. And now with the new and improved neural network, it looks something like this. Okay, so up to 90% acceptance points, and you still don't really take a hit in your accuracy. The key point from all this method is that you can fit a model that relates X to theta, and then adjust using this model, the thetas for more bad or far X simulated. And this will allow you to accept more sample points and reduce the vulnerability of the algorithm to the curse of dimensionality. And already you might start to think of ways to improve this algorithm. And uh, I will talk about the next set of improvements and how this, these algorithms uh, evolved in the next video. So this is all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next one.